I could be brown, I could be blue, I could be violet sky, I could be hurtful, I could be purple, but this book I don't like. All right, now that I've aged the video horribly with a TikTok trend, let's talk about this Fantastic Four. More specifically, Marvel Knights 4, a book that started off so good and had so much potential and then just crapped it all away by the end. So where do your favorite superheroes get their money? Daredevil's a lawyer, Superman's a reporter, Moon Knight is just independently wealthy, and he drives a cab. The Fantastic Four, however, they had government grants. Had. Past tense. It was the mid-2000s, and Mark Wade was writing the Fantastic Four main book with art by Mike Wirango, and honestly, it was one of the best Fantastic Four runs in decades. There were some very iconic stories come out, things were going great, and then right in the middle of that run, they both got fired. Then President of Marvel, Bill Jemis, wanted the Fantastic Four to be something that he called working class heroes. He wanted them to be broke, he wanted them to be kicked out of the Baxter building, and he wanted them to have to work nine to five jobs while being superheroes on the side. Of course, there was pushback from Wade because, you know, he was writing the story. He didn't really have it going in that direction. But Jemis then went and had him fired, and Mike Waringo left. He quit in solidarity. Not unlike what happened with James Gunn years later, DC saw top talent being let go for Marvel and was like, hey, hey, come here, do whatever you want. So Wade and Waringo were tapped to do a Legion of Superheroes book for DC. They were getting ready to do it and everything. And this is where Roberto Aguirre Sacasa comes in. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, Roberto was a playwright, and he'd recently made a name for himself with an Archie play. Uh, it was called Weird Comic Book Fantasy. It was originally based off of Archie Comics and about how he dealt with coming out of the closet. Uh, and of course, names had to be changed for obvious legal reasons. Uh, side note on that, uh, Roberto actually ended up helping develop the TV show Riverdale for the CW. And he became a chief creative officer at Archie Comics. Aguirre Sacasa was hired to write this new take on the first family of Marvel. Uh, he was teamed up with a relative newcomer artist in Steve McNiven. McNiven, even as a newcomer, was not known for the speed of his art, but like with the quality that came out, who really cared? So because of the slow art and Roberto just dipping his toes into the medium of comics, they needed to buy a little more time. So Wade and Moringo were brought back to do two final issues. While they're making those issues, there was a big shakeup up in the higher floors of the Marvel building, and uh, Bill Jemis was fired, and he was replaced by Joe Quesada, for better or for worse. And Quesada took the idea of the working class heroes and said, nah, this needs to be over in its own book. It needs to be a Marvel Knights book. And the rest, I guess, is history. I'm Hossman17. I would really appreciate if you hit a like on this video and subscribe to my content. So at the time, I said, I was reading the mainstream Fantastic Four book by Wade, and I was really enjoying it for what it was. I am not a huge fan of the Fantastic Four in general. Um, I like them. I love the idea of them. I like when they come into the big events and where they cross over to other stuff, but I typically don't read Fantastic Four by themselves. But like I said, this run that Wade was doing was top tier. So I do remember when Marvel Knights 4 came out and I kind of thought, mm, I don't need two Fantastic Four books, so I honestly didn't read it. Uh, Marvel Knights was usually relegated to more street-level heroes anyway, like Wolverine was in there, but it was Spider-Man, Daredevil, uh, Black Panther folded in, like just, usually not the bigger galactic stuff wasn't the Marvel Knights. That, and I really wasn't interested because the covers were just pretty bland and boring. Now I know, you're not supposed to judge a book by the cover, but either way, I didn't read it. Now 17 years later, I'm doing some research for this YouTube channel, uh, reading through an old Wizard magazine looking for a very specific article, and I came across in Wizard number 148 a full reprinting of the first issue of Marvel Knights 4. So 17 years after its initial release, I read it. And I was hooked. Now, honestly, this video is going to be a little different than the others. I'm not going to give you an exact play-by-play -play of what happened in every single issue and a breakdown, because I am covering 30 issues here, <laughs> though the back half will be very, very quick. Uh, but basically, the Fantastic Four lose all their money. The government has cut fundings for scientific research and whatnot, and so they're not getting any more money. Uh, but then on top of that, a their money manager, Terry Giometti, has stolen all their money and left the country. He's gone. So they have no money, and at the end of the first issue, the city says, well, if you're not paying us back for damages you've caused, we're not letting you have the Baxter building. So they're, they're broke and homeless. And honestly, like, that's where the brilliance of this book comes from. Like, it's not just like, oh, hey, let's make the Fantastic Four broke and homeless and see what they do. Because, like, in hands of a less talented writer, that could have fallen flat. But here, it actually delves so deep into the character. Like, over the next few issues, they're rarely even in their costumes. They do fight crime, but there's no big super villains. They have to get jobs. Mr. Fantastic actually ends up getting a temp job at a law firm doing IT. 
Uh, Susan Storm gets a job as a substitute English teacher. Ben Grimm ends up getting a job on a work site. And that, like, we just, we get to see another side of these people. Uh, interestingly enough, like, Ben Grimm, the thing, throughout the issues you see, like, he's walking around and he's, like, carrying pallets of cinder blocks at a time. And the guys on the job site are like, hey, Ben, I understand you're doing this to help your family and everything, but, like, we got families too. So if you could kind of cut back a little bit, that'd be wonderful. And Ben's like, Ugh, yeah, I suppose. And in subsequent issues, you do you see him doing the same thing, but he's carrying one brick at a time. And it's little stuff like that is amazing. Uh, the most amazing story of them all in their journeys to find jobs is Johnny Storm, the Human Torch. He tries a few different things. He wants to try acting, but his agent is like, dude, you suck. And you're overexposed and nobody wants to see you. And he ends up kind of coming to a realization after his girlfriend breaks up with him. His girlfriend, I... He has a girlfriend in this book named Courtney. Courtney Keaton. Oh, she is a piece of work. I hate Courtney Keaton. It, at the very beginning, they're all at Franklin's birthday party, and she's like, dude, Johnny, this blows. I want to leave. And he's like, man, it's my nephew. Like, what are you doing? She's like, no. Eh. Oh. Then they lose all their money, and she's like, eh, Johnny, you're a husband. And she breaks up with him, and I just... She's a piece of work. I don't like her. They get back together. <clears throat> anyway, Johnny uh, decides he actually wants to do some good. He wants to grow up. He wants to mature. And he does. He matures and grows throughout this book as he goes through the training to try and become a firefighter. Which makes perfect sense, really. He's immune to fire. But he has a really hard time of it because a lot of the firemen don't respect him. They're like, oh, you're just a superhero. You fly in. And this is after 9-11. So, I mean, firefighters had to have a rough go of it. Uh, and as the chief points out, like... For years, a lot of these guys have been putting out the fires that you start, Johnny. So he does have a hard time gaining their respect. That he does. He works through, he gains their respect, and he becomes a part of that team. And throughout the whole thing, like they do stop little crimes here and there. Like Ben is out getting coffee for his crew. Somebody robs a jewelry store, he stops the truck. And he loses the coffee, and he's like, Man, ugh, I gotta pay for that. Um... Susan Storm stops a mugger in the park who steals somebody's purse. He stops it and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, I had no other options. You know, I used to be somebody and then I lost my job. I have no options. Uh, while Reed is at the welfare line, he runs into a guy who's like, yeah, I used to make 300k a year. Like, there's a really underlying theme just about how America is turning around and, like, jobs aren't what they used to be. And a lot of people are in this situation. I can't relate directly, but I think the Fantastic Four was really touching probably a lot of personal strings for people at this time. There's another issue where... Reed is on his way to work, and he sees someone who is up on a ledge about to commit suicide. So Reed obviously intervenes, and he goes up. And similar situation where the guy had, I believe he lost his job. Um, his son ended up dying in an accident, and then his wife left him. And after all that, he d discovered that he had lung cancer, and it was too late to do anything about it. it was, he was in the final stages. And he was just worried about dying alone. And Reed actually talks him down off the ledge and lets him know, when the time comes, give me a call. I will drop everything and be there so you don't need to be alone. It really humanizes the, the Fantastic Four. It brings them down. Like, they've been living up in the Baxter building. They've been going off to space and other dimensions on these adventures. You don't see them interact with regular people, except for Willie Lumpkin. Um, but you don't really see them interacting with regular people as regular people. And it was really good to see that. And this is just the first four issues. And something else happens. Uh, Hammerhead, a Spider-Man villain with the Magia, you know, mob boss Hammerhead, shows up and says, Hey, Mr. Fantastic, like, uh, the guy that once took your money, he took, I don't know, I'm doing this accent, the guy what took your money took some of our money too. And we're going to get him. We are going to get him, all right? But if you, a super guy like you, you could help us out, huh? And Mr. Fantastic, like, no, man, come on. I'm, I'm Mr. Fantastic. I'm the Fantastic Four. I'm not going to do that. But he does say that deep down, a part of him wants to. Like, a part of him wants to get revenge on the guy that ruined his family. The next three issues um, has more of Johnny becoming the fireman, and then uh, everybody else takes the kids camping. It's weird. It's disjointed from the rest of the book. There are these aliens in New Jersey that are taking people. And they're not a breed of aliens we've ever seen. They're, it's interesting. It's an interesting story. Uh, it turns out people in town know that these aliens are taking people, and Sue yells at this one old man, says, you suck. You know these aliens are taking people, and you just let it happen. Maybe this cycle needs to stop, you damn dink of a man, she says, basically. Um, and then they go, and they f help everybody, and they save everybody that needs to be saved. I guess the past 40 years don't count. Uh, and they go back to town, and then this is just an interesting thing that's not really touched upon. That old man takes Sue's words to heart, and he puts a shotgun in his mouth and kills himself. <laughs> One might argue that Sue Storm made a man kill himself. That would probably 
weigh heavily on her, if she even knew about it, I guess. That's not touched upon. Part of the downfall of this book is its lack of follow-through. Issue 8 and 9 have Namor show up. And this is awesome. Like, it's just, it's more of this interpersonal stuff. Instead of just like, worlds are being battled. Like, they just have these inner struggles of real people. Uh, and Namor shows up and he's like, Sue, hello, I'm Namor. So I hear Reed is broken homeless. <laughs> he can't take care of you. Like, run away with me, Sue. Because that's what Namor does. <laughs> Namor always wants to make Reed look bad, and he wants to steal Sue. And Sue's like, no, man. Namor, like, I'm I'm with Reed. Come on. Uh, and Reed actually shows up and fights. <laughs> they fight. There are, I mean, there are fights in this. One part is really cool. Like, Reed just sits here talking and lecturing Namor, and Namor's like, what are you doing? Why are you talking and not fighting? And Reed's like, oh, I was just prattling on, hoping I could distract you from the fact that I'm shifting 70% of my body's density to my right fist. And he's like, crack, and just punch them. Uh, and they have a good fight, uh, and that story actually intersects with Johnny. Uh, someone comes into the fire station, who, and her son is missing. And she's like, I've gone to the police, but they're not going to do anything yet. Like, I don't know where else to go. I'm checking with the firemen. And Johnny's like, absolutely, heck yeah, we'll help you. And the firefighters are like, Johnny, we don't do that, kind of. And Johnny's like, well, come on, we have to. Like, this is what we're supposed to be here for. So he's still playing more of the hero than falling into the firefighter role. So Johnny goes off to look for the kid himself. He ends up getting Namor's help. Turns out the guy had fallen through the ice, and Namor finds his body, and they bring the body back. And that's sad. That's quite sad. I will point out the uh, the art change. McNiven fell off at some point, I believe, after the seventh issue. I'm not sure if he did covers or not. I will look into it and put some text down at the bottom to confirm what I'm rambling about. Be around issue 10, where things kind of changed. It all kind of built to this. This is when a villain finally shows up. Uh, Psycho Man. Psycho Man shows up in New York and he basically takes all of New York City hostage. And it's awesome. The Fantastic Four, like, they're all at their day jobs and people are like, ooh, like, Reed's clocking away his computer and this secretary or someone comes in and is like, uh, Mr. Fantastic, like, you should check the news because there's something I think you and your family need to deal with. And, like, Ben is on the job site and a giant hole opens up and this plant monster comes out and they're like, Ben! <laughs> Come help us! Uh, so everybody gets involved in this, and the Psycho Man can basically bring people's fears to life. He's closed off the whole New York City, and he's got, like, there's zombies attacking, there's robots attacking, there's... All these things are happening, and it's just really awesome because the Fantastic Four still, even though they don't have their government funding, they don't have their jets and everything, they're still fighting the good fight. And they are across the city, like, Ben is... Uh, the Thing is fighting lion statues outside a library, and Johnny and his firemen are fighting zombies out in the woods, and Reed is researching everything. Everybody's doing everything together, and but they're like, they're using cell phones. They're coordinating each other. They're talking on cell phones. It's really subtle, honestly, but it's kind of genius. Like normally they'd have interdimensional headsets or something, but this is just like they're on cell phones. They're not even wearing their costumes. Like they are just literally everyday people fighting crime, and it's it's great. Uh, and then it turns out Psycho Man has converged in the Baxter building, so they do have to meet up in the Baxter building, and they do put their costumes back on. They go, they defeat Psycho Man, and this is where the book falls apart. This is where it didn't stick the landing. This is issue 13. God, it bothers me. Because everything up to this point, I was, I was enjoying it so much. I was loving this book. I was thinking, this is an amazing take on the Fantastic Four. Yes, it didn't mesh with the other book going on at the same time, but it could have been its own little story about the time the Fantastic Four were homeless. Like We all knew they weren't going to stay broke and homeless, but for it to end this way was just ridiculous. It was such a cop-out. And it's not like they changed writers. Roberto Aguirre Sacasa was still writing the book. He wrote the book for all 30 issues. So the fact that he just copped it out like this really bothers me, and it's what makes the whole book not worth it, in my opinion. Basically, at the end of the issue, they're, they defeat the Psycho Man, they're up on the roof of the Baxter building, and Sue's like, man, this is great. Look at this, we're back on the Baxter building. And Reed's like, no, it should be different. Uh. <laughs> and he basically admits that he's like, no, when I let that guy steal our money, like, I thought, I thought that'd be an interesting experiment, but, like, Johnny really grew as a person, Ben really grew, like... And he, he basically admits that he let it happen. And Sue's like, well, obviously, you're the smartest person on the planet. You could have figured this financial stuff out in a second. But, of course, back in issue two, he spent so much time. He was trying to figure out how to win the stock market. Like, he was deeply invested in it. He ignored his wife. He forgot to pick Franklin up at school. Like, he was deeply invested in trying to figure out how to win the stock market. To the point that he ignored his life around him, as he does sometimes. So, now, if he was doing this on purpose, he wouldn't have done that. 
I believe. So anyway, it's just like, oh, Reed, you're so smart. Why don't you just invent a cure for acne and we'll just get back to life? And he's like, yeah, okay. So they never say exactly what they do, but the next issue, they're like, oh, two months have passed and we're the Fantastic Four again. And we're back in the Baxter building and oh, what a crazy ride it's been. And then after that, they're just back to the Fantastic Four. And it's boring. It's boring. Because I just read how like, you know, Johnny Storm is trying to be a firefighter and Ben is working on a construction site and they're stopping muggers and then all of a sudden they're blasted to ancient Egypt. It's ridiculous. It's not ridiculous. Like, that is what the Fantastic Four is. So I guess shame on me for enjoying something different from the Fantastic Four. But then they go on, they fight the Impossible Man and I think Doctor Doom shows up. Um, just a bunch of classic Fantastic Four villains. There's some Inhuman stuff. Doctor Strange and shows up with actually a decent story. When they're getting all the money back, Sue does say, you know what, I do want to keep teaching when I can. She never teaches again. It's never mentioned again. It's never brought up again. Ben is never shown on the job site again. It's never mentioned again. Johnny is not a firefighter anymore. The only thing, the only thing that carried over from the first 13 issues is Courtney. Of all the things that could have carried over, why did Courtney carry over? She's still a piece of trash. I don't like her. I don't believe she ever appeared in any other book other than this, so I mean... Thank goodness for small favors. And it was just a typical Fantastic Four book after that. Until issue 28. Issue 28, when I think the book was already being cancelled, I think Roberto got an opportunity to put in something. He did close up. There was another story um, where Susan Storm is at work at Fantastic Corporation. Fantastic Enterprises? One of her employees comes to her and is like, my husband is treating me very poorly. You can read into that. I won't. And I, I that's more of a the human level stories that I was enjoying. Sue goes with her and confronts her husband and was like, knock it off, give her a divorce, and like, we got satellites, we're watching you for the rest of your life. You ever treat another woman poorly, you're done. You're done. So I enjoyed that. Uh, and similarly, at the same time, in that same issue, uh, Mr. Fantastic is at an Illuminati meeting, and he gets a phone call. And he's like, oh, hello. And he's like, I gotta go to the hospital. And he turns off his phone, he ends up the meeting, and he goes to the hospital, and it's the guy from the fourth issue that uh, was dying of cancer. And Mr. Fantastic sits there and spends the night with him, as he promised, he would be the last face he sees. He will not die alone. And it was just, it was that more human stuff from the Fantastic Four. For the first time ever, I actually like, really enjoyed a Fantastic Four book. And halfway through, it just twisted itself on the head to get right back to normal and made the first half irrelevant. If that's something that interests you, I highly recommend, um, actually, you can pick up this very collection. It collects the first 13 or so issues. It collects the good issues. <laughs> uh, actually, goes... Yeah, it goes up to when they get their money back, and then two more issues. So, I mean, some of it is its really good. I really do actually recommend reading it. I just don't recommend reading all 30 issues. I recommend reading the first 13, and then number 28. Issue 30, they have an open house at the Baxter Building, and they kind of bring in everybody from the entire series. It's kind of a nice homage. It's a send-off. It's a nice, supposed to be a heartfelt send-off. Uh, looking back at it, it's weird, because it ends with the Fantastic Four. Like, hey, we're all happy and stuff. And the book ended because Civil War was happening. And Civil War was not a happy time for the Fantastic Four. So it's a bittersweet book. It was a book that as I was reading it, I was like, man, I can't wait to read all 30 issues of these. I can't wait to make this video. Uh, and then as I got past it, I was like, I'm, I'm so disappointed. I'm so disappointed in the follow through of this book. I don't know what to say. Different kind of video today. Like, subscribe, comic book content here at Hossman17. I, uh, yeah, I depressed myself. I depressed myself by believing this book would be something else. Uh, yeah, I'll catch you next week when I talk about something that I enjoyed.